Good evening, church family, and welcome to our evening broadcast worship service for the Church of Christ at Holmes Road. Thank you for joining us. We'll start out with a prayer before our first song. Pray with me, please. Dear God, we come to you thanking you for being our God and asking that you bless this service, Lord. As we worship you in spirit and truth, Lord, pray that the things that we say and do uh, are pleasing in your sight. Lord, we are so thankful for your son and for his great sacrifice for our sins, Lord. Bless us this day as we worship you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. First song is Because He Lives. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives i can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross that river, I'll fight life's fire. No war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Amen, church. Our next song. Uh, it's 535, Glory Land Way, be the song before the lesson. <clears throat> I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. 
Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way groweth clearer for I'm in the glory land way. List to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wanderers come home, oh, hasten to obey, for I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Oh, heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer, for I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for I'm in the glory land way. Amen, church. Good evening, church. Welcome back. I hope you are uh, were able to worship with us this morning and you're back with us for a Sunday evening service together. Uh, appreciate you taking time out from football to get this uh, uh, service in together and uh, hopefully it will be a benefit and a blessing to you and hopefully it'll be a blessing to Jesus Christ as you worship him in spirit and song with us this evening as we are looking at the uh, book of second John uh, we have been in a sermon series on Sunday nights looking at first second and third John and uh, we're going to we have just finished up all of first John and so now we're looking at second John together and hopefully it'll be a blessing to you we're, we're just going to go look at the first three verses of, of 2 John here this evening because uh, those are just the introductory. Uh, if you're wanting to outline uh, 2 John, it's pretty simple. The first three verses are the introduction, verses 4 through almost that last verse is the body, and then you have a closing. So it's pretty simple. And uh, 2 John uh, is considered to be the most overlooked and neglected book in the New Testament. People who study these things... Uh, they say James or the Gospels, obviously, with James with being so practical for all of us, uh, giving such life advice in the book of James. That seems to be the most studied, and of course the Gospels are, are there, right there with James. And, but the lowest, the least studied, the least looked at, it seems to be the most overlooked and neglected book is Second John. Uh, people... Uh, even first and third John are ranked higher, much higher above it, probably because it's in the middle, right? Just like when we sing a song, right? If there's a three-verse song, you sing the first and the last, kind of skip the second verse. That's kind of the way people act like with, with the books of John. They, they don't mind reading the first one. They don't mind reading the third one. But, but second John, for some reason, gets overlooked the most. Third John is the shortest book in the New Testament. And that's why many people maybe want to read third John, because they know it's the shortest. They see it's the smallest book. So let's go to it, and they'll read First John because it's the first one. But but uh, it's all, Second John seems to get overlooked. It's closely followed by Second John as far as length. They're both Second and Third John are very small letters. They, that's why we don't say chapters. We don't say Second John chapter one or chapter. There is no chapters. It's just uh, some verses because it's both Second and Third John are so small. But just because they're small doesn't mean it's not some powerful teaching. And just because it's very short, you could read it in probably less than a minute. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a very small letter. But even though it's small and short and concise, it is packed full of important uh, information. And that's why it is, it, I mean, all of Scripture is important, right? And so let us not overlook Second John in our daily studies. As we ask about the setting... What's going on here with 2 John? Well, 
First of all, let me just say it's pretty much the same as 1 John. It's pretty much the exact same. Uh, he's dealing with those same three errors that we dealt with in 1 John. He's dealing with the false teaching of docetism, which means which is that common philosophy that Gnostics come out of where, where they, they claim that Jesus was God, but he wasn't the son of man in the flesh. Uh, and so that he was dealing with that issue still in 2 John. Uh, the second issue he's dealing with, we saw it in the first letter, but many people claim to be above sin. Many people in this particular time, in this particular congregation, because we're Christians, it's impossible for us to sin. They thought it's, it's impossible. No matter what we do, even if we do something wrong, it's not considered sin because we're in the body of Christ and he just washes us all the time. And so we can do no wrong is kind of their philosophy. And so people thought we can't sin because we're in Christ. And so they didn't bother trying to keep God's commandments because they just kind of felt whatever they did, it wasn't considered a sin anyway because that's how much grace and the blood of Christ covers. And so John had to deal with that as well. And then the third uh, thing there is the the church there that John's writing to, they were kind of cliquish. They tend to like who they liked. They tend to love who they wanted to love. And they didn't, a lot of, they didn't love a lot of outsiders. They didn't love anyone outside of their, their little inner circle. And so they were cliquish and they failed to love all their brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, because of that, because of their lack of love for each other, uh, this is one of the reasons uh, John uh, needed to write this letter. So it's the same group of people that went through that split and all that stuff from 1 John, but he's dealing with these three errors within the book of 2 uh, John. Um, many people will say, well, you know, well, we'll get into this in a second. Let's go ahead and jump into 2 John chapter, uh, uh, how I said chapter, verse 1. 2 John verse 1. Let's look at this says, the elder, to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not, only, and not I only, but also all who know the truth. So John here identifies himself as the elder. Uh, in, in case you are wondering, is this really John? Maybe because someone else, he didn't say it's me, John. It's universally accepted this is John. We know it's him from his his style of writing. We know it's him from uh, his emphasis and from even the acceptance of the early church. There's just so much evidence. It's universally accepted. I don't think anyone doesn't agree that it is John writing here. And so why does, he, why does he call himself the elder here in this particular uh, passage? Was he the elder of the congregation that he's writing to here in Ephesus? Is he saying, I'm the, the elder, just like we have elders. We have Marvin, Jerry, uh, Roger, Chris, and Dave, is, is, is he saying I'm an elder of the church that I'm writing to? Well, uh, what does he mean by this? Uh, the answer to the question, is he an elder of this particular congregation? The answer is no, not at all. This is a term that is used when he calls himself uh, the elder. This is a term in Greek that means age. He's saying, I'm old, is basically what he's saying. The old man is writing you, is basically what he's saying here. It is presumed that John is about 90 years old at the time of this writing. Uh, many people know and believe that John is the only apostle that was actually able to live out of natural life, or died of uh, not martyrdom. Uh, uh, but uh, all the others are, were killed for their faith, but it is believed John died naturally, and so... Here, this is one of the last books written, one of the last ones, uh, but he's almost believed to be 90 years old at the time of this writing. And so when he says the elder, he's not saying the elder in terms of office. This is not the Greek term used for a position of office, as we would say the elders of the church. He was just simply saying, I'm an old man. He's, he's designating himself as being at an advanced age. So he's saying, I am the elder, I am old, I have wisdom, I have life experience. And so that's what he's writing, and that's how he identifies himself. I, the old man John. Uh, now there's a debate as to who is written to. We, we see where it says the elder, John. He says, to the lady chosen by God and her children. Now there's a debate amongst scholars as to who this lady and her children 
are. And the debate is, is it literal or is it figurative? And, and so a lot of people, this, I mean, there's a lot of people on both sides of this argument. Uh, even in our own churches, in our own brotherhoods, people are, tend to argue, is he writing one particular person and calling her the lady and specifying, talking about her family, or is it more figurative? The literal, the people who fight for the literal side say this is a time of persecution. The church is being persecuted. And John, when he says to the lady chosen by God, he's, he, he didn't want to name the actual person in his writing or in his letter because if the Romans found this, if the Romans found this particular letter and saw the person's name, then they would kill that individual. It would have been proof that this person is a believer in God and they would have had the right to then kill under Roman law this person at this time. <clears throat> and so a lot of people believe he was, that John was just writing to one particular person, an individual leader or an elder in the congregation at that time and simply chose the, the term lady chosen by God as a pseudonym to hide that one person's identity. But then there are the figurative people that, that come along and say, no, 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 this is not written to one person. This is a general term. The elect lady is, refer is referencing the whole church. He's writing to an entire congregation of people. And the, the, the elect lady would be the church, and the children that are mentioned would be all the individual members of that congregation. Now, uh, as far as my own personal belief, I tend to fall more towards the figurative. I, I think he, in 1 John, he obviously wrote to a whole group of church. He wrote to a whole congregation of people, and I think he's writing to the same group. I just think he, he just, he, he just uh, uh, wanted to write in a more figurative term as opposed to being more direct uh, years later uh, in his year, in later down the road. But if people want to argue, say, no, it was a single person. Okay, I'm not going to argue that point. If you want to believe a single person, that's fine. It doesn't change any of the messages in the letter. Uh, but uh, but um, either way, there's really no way to know for sure. That's what I want to tell you. There's no way anybody can be super confident whether it's literal or figurative. But uh, regardless of whether it's literal or figurative, it is important for all of us to understand and he says here, the lady chosen by God, your children, whom I love in the truth. Is this shocking to you that John's first subject that he addresses is love? I mean, uh, you know, the, whether it's individual, whether he's writing to an individual or a congregation, John's purpose is to encourage them. And John, he says, I love this chosen lady. Whether it's this, uh, the individual person he's writing to, the leader in the church, or if he's writing to the church, he says, I love this, this lady. I love them. I love them in the truth. Not only John, but everyone who knows truth. He, he's, really, he, he's bringing a lot of love to who he's sending this letter to. He says, not only I, but everyone who knows truth, everyone who believes in Jesus Christ and believes that he was the son of God and son of man and who believes all of that, we all love you. And we all love the chosen lady. And so the implication here is that anyone who knows Christ, anyone who, who, lo who knows Christ loves those who also know Christ. And I don't know about you, but this is a great encouragement to me and to know that if I'm traveling around America and my car breaks down, I can call someone in the church in that particular town to know that they're going to love me and help me out. That's the way we are in the brotherhood. That's the way we are in the church. When I was in college, I had the great opportunity to be part of the a cappella chorus. And we traveled so much. Every, every semester, we were traveling all over this great United States of America. And every town we went to that we did a concert in, we would stay with people in the homes of, who belonged to that church. And it was just so interesting. No matter who, what town we were at, no matter where, places I've never even heard of before, we're staying with, and we would start making connections. Hey, I know so-and-so, you know so-and-so, hey! It was like a big family. Everywhere we went, we, we made connections. 
And that's the way the church is supposed to be. And that's what John is saying here. I love you, the lady, and so does everyone else who knows the truth. Isn't it nice to know, Lansing? Isn't it nice to know people in Holmes Road Church of Christ? Isn't it nice to know that we love each other, but we're also loved by people in Texas, in California, in New Mexico, in Colorado, in Florida, people we don't even know love us. Isn't that encouraging? That's what the family of God is about. And that's exactly what John is mentioning and teaching here. The church is an international place of love and acceptance. No matter where you go in this life, there is a place you can find love and acceptance. To our graduates, when they graduate from college, when they start picking out where they want to go for college, I I don't care what college you pick, I don't care what college you go to, get with the church. Stay loyal to the church because that's where you're going to find your love and that's where you're going to find acceptance. Whenever you move to a new town, if a job ships you around, if you get, if you get sent over here for an, another job or whatever, find the church. Find the church because that's where you're going to find love and acceptance. And folks at Homes Road, we need to be that kind of people for everyone that shows up at, the, at our door. Everyone that walks in our doors at Homes Road Church of Christ, we're going to be opening again soon. And when people come, no matter where they're from, no matter where they're at, they need to know this place loves them. Whether they're just passing through, whether they're new to our community, or whether they're from our community and looking to make a home, whatever the situation is, they need to leave knowing that they are loved and accepted here at this body. That's what John is doing for these people. The, the love of the church is anywhere. And the love of the church is an anywhere, forever loving family. And that's exactly what John is pointing out here to, to his receivers of the letter. Look at verse 2. Because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Because of Christ, that's, the, that's what John's point here is. You can have this kind of love and acceptance because of the truth, because of Jesus Christ. The reason we have this benefit of international love, no matter if you go anywhere in the States, no matter if you go to Africa, Australia, Russia, China, wherever you go in this world, you're going to find the church and you're going to find someone that loves you and accepts you. And that benefit only exists because of Jesus Christ. We would not be able to have that. We would not be able to travel and find a brotherhood, find people who love and accept me anywhere I go in this world if it wasn't for Jesus. He is the cornerstone. He is the keystone of that benefit because he is truth. Now, I I love this concept John constantly brings up that Jesus is truth. That means you can count on it. When something is true, you can count on it. And that's why he, he always says Jesus Christ is truth, meaning you can count on Jesus Christ. You can count on someone loving and accepting you everywhere you go. Because anywhere you go, if you can find someone who loves Christ, then they're also going to love you. And he says you can count on it. You can have faith on it because all of that is truth. Truth never lets you down. His love and his people's love exists forever. And he even says in there, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Forever. It doesn't, it doesn't stop even when the world ends. The love of the body of Christ exists now and it's going to exist even after we die. It's going to exist in this world as well as the next. The love of the church family is never ceasing. And that's why when we have people that die in our brotherhood, we're sad and we miss them and we mourn because we don't get to see them. But we don't, we're not like the rest of the world who's given up hope. We're going to see, be with them and see them again someday and share our love with them and have received their love again. And it's all because of Christ. It's that forever love in a family. and It's all because 
of Jesus. And that's what John is saying here in his, in his introduction. And then look at verse 3. His last verse of his introduction before he gets into the body. He says, Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. All right, so this salutation that he says here, this salutation of the grace, mercy, and peace, those were a common trio in most Jewish writings. If I was just going to, if I was Jewish, even today or back then, whenever it was, and I was writing a beloved, say I was writing my dad, I'd say, grace, mercy, and peace be with you, dad. I want to talk to you about it. And then you go on. It was a common salutation. It was the standard Jewish blessing. It was practiced in just about every single Jewish writing of that time as well as even a custom today. You always said grace, mercy, and peace. Shalom and mercy and love. That's how Jews greeted and began any letter. However, John expanded on that traditional Jewish custom. He didn't just say grace, mercy, and peace. He, he, he included that, that typical Jewish custom. But he, he said, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So he expanded on the typical uh, Jewish custom. He added, we, we will be with you from God the Father. Remember, the first letter was really all about confidence. If Remember, all those are they're all posted on YouTube and Facebook. You can go back and read all of all of First John. But the the main emphasis of First John was about building confidence in people's faith, building confidence in things. And this the the last letter taught you that the last letter we looked at, First John, it taught us that when we have a strong faith, it translates to confidence in our prayers. We saw that in chapter five, as we were in First John chapter five, as we were closing out that that book here. John here is not just wishing grace, mercy, and peace to the chosen lady. John is confidently bestowing grace on them. He doesn't say, I, I hope you have mercy, and grace, and peace. I, I'm hoping you have that. That's not what he said here. He said, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you. That's almost like a command. You have it. John is confidently saying that grace, mercy, and peace is on them. And the reason he has the confidence to say it's on you is because he's asked God for it. So he's, he's, he's even demonstrating the faith of his prayer, the confidence of his prayer, saying, I know you already have these things in your life because I asked God for them. That's directly off that first, the lesson from first, the, the first letter. He's demonstrating how his confidence in prayer is by when he says this. Uh, he's saying, I know God is giving you those things. Because I asked him to do so. When we ask God for blessings for others, do we have that same kind of confidence that the prayers will be answered in the same fashion that, Do that John displays here? When whenever someone is sick and you pray for them, you say, Father, help this person to be better. When you call them, do you say, hey, I know, I know health is upon you already because I prayed for it. I, I know you're doing better, right? And, and it's that kind of confidence, and that's the, the kind of lesson that John is saying here. The readers may already be encouraged here. R readers are already encouraged. John is not hoping for blessings. He's saying, I'm confident you are receiving them because I've already asked it. John then adds two more things to the tradition of salutation. He, he says, uh, in truth and love. And do you kind of see that constantly coming up from John? I mean, this was a typical pattern in 1 John. In fact, this is one of the criticisms people have. Uh, I'm tired of him. They, they say he just says the same thing over and over and over. It's one of the, the critics uh, say about the letters of John. It says he just keeps harping on the same thing over and over again. And that's right. I mean, uh, do you, you can see an overriding pattern in John's life and teaching. He's constantly teaching about these two things, truth and love. John cannot hardly write a single verse without mentioning these, one of these two favorite topics of his. 
He, he's always doing this. Even when John does write a new topic, if he goes to a new subject, kind of gets distracted, he'll go back to the topics of truth and love every time, doesn't he? That's what we saw in first, in first John. He's always weaving love and truth into whatever topic he may be discussing. And that's exactly what we see here. He's even weaving the, the concepts of truth and love into his salutation, into his hello statements. Hi, truth and love. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just John. He, he wants truth and love to be permeated in who he is. John's implication here is obvious. He's saying you cannot have grace, mercy, and peace. That, those, that typical Jewish blessing, that typical Jewish introduction. He's saying you can't have those things apart from God's truth and love. If you want God's truth and want God's love, then, then those other things come naturally. When you're seeking God's truth and you're doing everything you can to stay in Christ and abide in Him and to be loved and to find His love and to love others, He says grace, mercy, and peace, they're just going to come. They're natural byproducts of those things. What the Jews would wish on each other, every time they wrote a letter, grace, mercy, peace to you, which they wished on each other for years and years, John says it will not be accomplished unless you're rooted in Jesus Christ, in God's truth and love. Are you seeking peace today in your life? Do you say, my life is chaotic. Man, I wish I had some peace. Do you say, man, I, I, just, I wish I had some mercy. I wish I had some grace. It's ready. You just need to live in Christ and show love to Christ and love to others, and those things will come to you. It's an important lesson here for all of us to remember. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Do you wish you had grace, mercy, and peace in your life? Well, then you should, you're going to reap what you sow. Maybe if you're wanting more peace in your life, you need to give more peace. Are you showing grace, mercy, and peace to others out of love and truth for Christ? Well, if not, what John's point here, if not, you're not going to receive it. God's not going to give it to you. Why would God give you grace, mercy, and peace if you're not giving grace, mercy, and peace to others? You're a reflection of Him on this world. If you're calling yourself a Christian and a follower, you're a reflection of God to other people. And if you're not giving grace, mercy, and peace to others, God's not going to give it to you. You reap what you sow. But if you do do those things, if you are abiding in Christ and love Him and love His truth and showing love and truth to others, then God is going to shower you with unceasing power He's going to shower you with immense amount of grace, mercy, and peace in your life. Notice the phrasing of John's final point here in the salutation. He used the physical description of a father and a son. Now, he did that on purpose. The Apostle John, as I mentioned before, he's still fighting docetism here, that false teaching. And in the... Those false teachers, they denied that Christ was ever in the flesh. Docetists and Gnostics all believed that they did not use the term the Son of God because the Son, that was a physical description. They would say He is God, but they wouldn't use the term Son of God. And that's, that was typical of Docetists and Gnostics of the time. They refused to word, use the word Son because that implied a physical description. Luke and Mark are my physical children on this earth. And so to use the word son in describing Jesus would imply a physical description. And so therefore, Dostas and Gnostics refused to use that term. But the apostle here, John, John writes the phrase in such a way that he is keeping that miraculous conception of Christ in the flesh, in the mind of the readers. He was born flesh of Mary, in the virgin birth. And so he's called the son. And so the, the apostle here, he is, he is simply challenging docetists and Gnostics in their belief. To deny that Jesus is, is not a son of God in the flesh, it, that means that is idolatry. 
That's what we talked about in the first uh, in first John. And that's how he ended the letter in first John. Remember, he said, "Keep yourself from adultery." That was the last sentence in first John in the first John letter. And and so here we see once again in the salutation, John is making sure he is not has any part of idolatry. He's saying he is the Son of God. He was physical. And so John is reminding them by the use of this this description by saying the the Son of Man or the Son of God here using that term Son, he he's reminding them to hold to the fact that Jesus is one hundred percent God and one hundred percent man, which is the very groundwork of our faith and our salvation. And and so that that's how we're going to leave this lesson for tonight. We're in. We're going to get into the body of the letter uh, next week and weeks to come. But uh, just wanted to, to, this was the introduction of the lesson. Truth and love, grace, mercy, and peace. If you need any of these things in your life, maybe you need to reach out. Maybe you need to reach out and reach to the church because the church is the place of acceptance and love. The, universally, the church is the place to go. If you're in New Mexico, if you're in Colorado, Texas, wherever, here in Lansing, reach out to the church if you need anything so that we can show you the love of Christ. If you need to study the Word so you can become a, a Christian. Some of you out there maybe are not baptized into Christ and, and you, you don't know what even that means. We're here to study with you. We want to get with you and study the Word together. But you have to let us know. You have to reach out and say, I want to study, I want to do, and we will reach to you. If you have anything, call one of the others, call me, and that is the lesson for you. Let us continue our end song together. Thank you, Brother Stan, for that message. Truth and love, you only find that in God's word, word and grace, mercy, and peace. Certainly that's what this world needs now, more than ever. Wonderful message. Uh, let's be about the business of applying that in our lives, in our daily walk. Closing song is I'll Be Listening. When the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. When the Savior calls, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Yes, for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my heart is right when he calls me, if my heart is right, I will hear. If my heart is right when he calls me, oh, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Yes, for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my robe is white when he calls me, if my robe is white, I will hear. If my robe is white when he calls me, oh, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name yes for my name oh i'll be somewhere listening i'll be somewhere listening i'll be somewhere listening for my name amen church how uh, you bow with me in closing prayer please heavenly father we come to you in prayer again thanking you for being our god and blessing us lord forgive us of our sins Watch over us, Lord. Uh, we pray that you bless and keep and comfort and strengthen those we lifted up in prayer this morning, Lord. And pray that you 
cause our hearts to be happy, happy in love and peace and grace and mercy so that people see the face of Christ on us. They see Christ in us and we're able to share your gospel message. Lord, we're living in troublesome times in this world, uh, tough times, many people are struggling and you're right there, Lord, waiting for them to come to you to obey the gospel. Lord, I pray that you bless us Christians, encourage us Christians, strengthen us Christians to be that light in this world, just like Christ is the light of the world. Let us also be that same light so that we can help bring others to you, Lord, so that they can come to know your son, Jesus, and have salvation. Bless us, Lord. Watch over us to our next appointed time. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. These things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.